So it's a very warm welcome to all of you from a sunny winter Oxford this afternoon. Um, thank you for coming from wherever you've come. This is um, Centre for Global Higher Education webinar 322, entitled International Academics in Mainland China. What do we know and what do we need to know? And we've got a, a star-studded lineup here um, today. Xin Chu from the University of Oxford is convening this group, but we also have Andrea Prone Strakalova from the um, Max Planck Institute of History of Science and Futo Huang from Hiroshima University of Japan. Um, unfortunately, Yuso Kai and Julio Limara when he won't be joining us, but but they um they are being represented by our three presenters today. Before I hand over, um, we have, as always have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, this webinar is being recorded. It'll be um, posted online, as with all our webinars, and there's a massive archive for us now to look through on the website tomorrow. We'll also post the transcript of the chat function. As ever, please keep yourself muted until you've been asked to ask a question. You can keep your video off if you want, but but please put it on when, when I ask you to ask a question. So at the end, um, please um, use the speaker view throughout so you can see what's happening. And at the end, to ask a question, use the chat function and I'll invite you to come up and ask a question. And you can unmute yourself and tell us where you're from and then, then you have the screen's yours. Great. Um, with no further ado, because we have um, three speakers, I'm going to um, immediately hand over um, back to Shin and a reminder of today's topic, international academics in mainland China. What do we know? What do we need to know? Shin, it's all yours. Thank you so much, David, for the kind introduction. And I will try to share the screen from that end first. I hope you can see it okay. Yes. So um, thank you so much again. And thank you all colleagues for joining us today. In the next 30 minutes or so, we'll focus on international academics in mainland China. And hereafter, we'll be referring to China. And we'll discuss what do we need to know about this group and what do we already know about this group of academics. Um, the presentation is based on collaborative work with the team listed on the page here. Unfortunately, Julia and Yudu are not able to join us today. So it will be Anja, Futa and myself for the presentation. And to start with, we will first discuss our existing knowledge about international academics in mainland China, drawing on a review of the literature and empirical evidence. And in the later parts, um, so perhaps to start with some background information, first of all, the uh, cross-border mobility of academics is an important global phenomenon but it is still relatively under-researched, especially when comparing um, with studies on international student mobility. And when looking at international academic mobility, um, Asia, or broadly conceptualized Global East, has developed several attractive destinations. And among them, China has become a uh, magnet for some international academics, and there are various reasons behind this. For instance, China has been rising as a global science power and the Chinese government and Chinese universities and institutions have also been offering generous recruitment offers for many of the international academics. And in addition, the local academic culture and lifestyle in China has become more westernized than before um, in the past decades. And at least before the pandemic, there have been political, institutional, and grassroots level initiatives that have been actively facilitating such academic mobility. And in the scholarship, there has been growing research interests about international academics working in mainland China, and our review of the literature found there, there are actually, broadly speaking, two cohorts of international academics. The first cohort, are usually university teachers and mostly uh, language teachers or those who work on short-term or part-time posts or those with honorary affiliates or those who are traveling spouses or Chinese ethnic returnees uh, to China. And this cohort emerged much earlier and many of the previous studies have been focusing on this group. However, we also identify that there has been a new cohort of international academics who are moving to China and in the most recent decade, 
and they are of non-Chinese nationality and non-Chinese ethnicity, and they work on full-time, long-term academic positions rather than temporary or short-term or teaching-only positions that were common in the previous cohort. While both cohorts now exist in China, there has been much less known about this new cohort. Um, we also note that there is a lack of unified definition about the international academics and reliable resources or comprehensive studies about this group. Therefore, in this study, we ask the question, uh, what are the major themes in the existing research on international academics in China, especially the new cohort, and what we can learn from the existing research? As mentioned, today's research draws on our collective works. You can find relevant publications on this page. Um, you can also find relevant publications from the, uh, from the three empirical studies that uh, we led representatively. Um, moving on about very briefly about the three projects that we conducted. All of the three projects focused on the new cohort of international academics in China and they were conducted in recent years. And all of the studies have covered a variety of universities and research institutions in China in different cities. Um, there are some differences in terms of the specific groups of international academics that each project focused on and different definitions of international academics have been used in each project. We'll come back to this ambiguity of uh, definitions very soon. And the three projects also have collected a wide range of data, including demographic profile information about international academics, survey responses, and interview data, which were conducted with international academics uh, and our Chinese administrators as well. We also collected policy documents. So moving on to the findings. The first question we'll discuss is what, who are international academics in China and how to define international academics in China. To start with, we found that the definition can be very ambiguous and there's no unified one. In practice and in research across the world, the term international academics can be used interchangeably with alternative terms such as academic migrants, uh, expatriate academic staff, foreign academics, etc. And in the Chinese context, the terminological ambiguities are associated with legal, social, political, historical, and cultural factors. So, for instance, the first major group of international academics in the People's Republic of China has been Soviet experts dating back to the 1950s. And then international academics working in China were called foreign cultural educational experts for many years. And later on, the term changed to foreign nationality teachers, which reflected the first cohort that I just noted, as many of them were mainly on teaching only positions. And it also focused on the nationality as a defining feature. A more recent term for international academics is called uh, foreign talents which has been associated with the talent schemes that China has initiated to attract highly skilled academic migrants. However, we also note that both the experts and talents have connotations that being international could mean having better capacities and having higher prestige. And this creates both privileges and challenges for international academics working in China and we'll be coming back to this point in the later discussions. In the scholarship, previous research has defined internationals in China by three major factors, uh, the place of birth, the nationality, or the ethnicity. Consequently, some of the studies included Chinese ethnic academics who returned to China but who are without Chinese nationality, while some of the studies only included, included those who are not Chinese ethnics or Chinese nationals. And previous research also defined academics differently and used different relevant concepts such as researchers, scholars, faculties, talents, academic staff, etc. So some of the studies included doctoral and postdoctoral researchers, some included full-time and visiting academics, and some focused only on 
full-time academics with uh, research, teaching, and administrative roles. So as a result of those multiple definitions that have been used, although many of the studies have been focusing on international academics, the groups of people they reached out to um, have been really different. And the results have been, uh, there are different uh, results and findings from the studies, and sometimes they can be conflicting with each other even. So facing this terminological ambiguity, we tried to come up with a framework to define international academics in the Chinese context. At this point, I'm glad to hand over to Angie to guide you through the framework and other findings. Thank so you very Angela. much, Jin. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So as Shin already outlined in detail, when we approached the topic and we read through the existing literature and compared our empirical research projects, we found out that there really is uh, ambiguity in terms of who actually is an international academic in China. And because of no unified definition, there's also no consistency in terms of the research findings, because depending how you define the phenomenon, how you de define the population under study, you will arrive at different conclusions. Um, that is why we thought it it was extremely important to establish some kind of clarity here. And uh, this is why I would like to present you a little bit uh, about the typological framework um, that we came up with. So really, uh, our typology is a continuum coming from a more narrow uh, definition to a broader definition. Um, this synthesizes uh, various sources of literature and basically, uh, as she already said in her previous slides, um, works with the assumption that an international academic in China is somebody who is not a uh, mainland Chinese national, national, okay, but where the types differ is really whether or not you include people with a Chinese ethnic background in your study or not, that really uh, touches mainly upon if you include Chinese returnees or not. Um, also, where uh, the, the definition where the different types differ is uh, whether or not you count in your study people who are only full time uh, full time faculty members in China who are long term based there so the, so, so to say the new cohort as she already introduced or whether you also work with uh, people who are part time faculty members visitors affiliated to Chinese institution institutions or postdocs or doctoral researchers. So here, as you can see on the, the type one on the left side, this is really the narrowest definition, which would exclude visitors, part-time um, academics who don't actually live uh, full-time in China. And it would also exclude those who are on a fixed term um, contracts doing their postdoctoral research or doctoral uh, research. Um, whereas on the more broad end of this continuum, uh, you would uh, include Chinese returnees uh, with who perhaps have a citizenship of another country and also include part-time faculty members, including doctoral researchers and short-term visiting academics. So in our research, uh, we've only looked at um, studies um, and working with people who are working for higher education institutions and, and research organizations. So uh, those job positions in these sectors have been the focus of, of our studies, how we define international academics in China. Of course, we are fully aware of the fact that there are also uh, colleagues uh, in the industry sector, um, and these have not been included in our study. Now, also, this type, this typology, could further be divided based on additional layers of, of various other characteristics. For example, countries of the doctoral education, previous work experience, languages spoken, and so on. So um, we hope that this typology could be useful also to contexts other than China. However, maybe the most relevant defining factors may change. Okay, uh, Xin, could you please switch to the next slide? Great. Um, now, in which disciplines have scholars studied the phenomenon of academics uh, moving uh, into, into mainland China? Uh, this is often an interdisciplinary research, uh, somehow mixing higher education and, and, and migration literature. Um, uh, there are studies that have uh, been published in higher education journals focusing on internationalization of Chinese universities, researchers mobility. There have been studies published more in uh, migration journals or sociology, international migration. Uh, studies that are more focusing on management of so-called 
expats or um, academic um, talents, um, also in relation to uh, joint ventures in higher education. There is also a group of literature coming from China studies, which recounts often the experiences or challenges of foreign China studies uh, experts or researchers, social scientists who work with uh, or do field work in China which is also a useful source. And last but not least, there's a wealth of non-scholarly reports which have been published in media um, and texts also, various kind of reports, uh, some of them funded also by public organizations like the EU. Uh, theoretically, uh, the studies have also approached a very, have also approached the, the subject uh, from very different uh, starting points. Some of the studies have looked at push factors and pull factors. Some of them employed human capital theory, looked at the social ties. Some of the studies have been purely inductive, some of them more abductive or more uh, coming from a more deductive sort of thinking with a, a fixed analytical framework. And most of the studies have been qualitative uh, with recently also an increased use of mixed methods. Yes, thank you, Shin. Now, uh, who are they and where are the international academics in China? What are the demographics of this, of this group? Uh, now, uh, as we have already uh, mentioned many times, the, the, the complexity around the definition in the existing literature affects the research question asked and also affects the research findings. Now, uh, the research has also made been made more difficult by a lack of official statistics. Uh, however, from what we know, we can conclude that there has been a significant growth until up to the point of the pandemic for sure. Um, and uh, what we know is that about 15 years ago, there were less than 10,000 people, foreign staff at Chinese universities. And in 2019, just before the pandemic, over 18,000 foreign staff uh, in Chinese universities. Now, in our uh, project, uh, where we looked specifically at the Europeans as a subset of this, of this population, the estimate, um, uh, uh, we arrived at the, at the finding that there are around 1,000 out of these are coming from Europe. This is an estimate. What is important to know that this is a very heterogeneous group, very heterogeneous. Uh, people who are coming to work in Chinese academia are arriving from very different cultural backgrounds. Uh, some of them are coming from the West, from the Anglo-Saxon world, from mainland Europe, of course, from Asia, less so perhaps from Latin America or Africa, but this is also something that would deserve further study. So it is a really very mixed picture and more research uh, should be made to bring up these more individual nuances. However, there are some kind of common features that are visible across literature and also across our three empirical projects. Uh, the number one clear theme is that most of international academics in, uh, in China are male. Um, this is not divergent from, so this is not China unique or di significantly divergent from other uh, contexts, but still most are male, significant majority are male, and uh, most of them also have degrees, PhD degrees from OECD countries. Um, so in uh, the project number three, which is uh, Shin and Julio's project, 77% um, uh, of the respondents were male. Uh, also, majority are coming from a natural science background, so STEM fields and life sciences. Uh, second, the most, uh, the, the second biggest group are social scientists and the, the smallest uh, group among these three are researchers coming from arts and humanities. Now, there also seems to be a pattern uh, with, in relation to in which career stage do uh, these people arrive in China, with the social scientist um, arriving at uh, an, usually at an earlier career stage. So during their PhD or even earlier, they somehow get hooked into China and then develop their scientific career on this kind of China-related path dependency. Whereas the STEM people, the natural scientists, often arrive in China, um, not because of China per se, but rather because of the job opportunity at the later uh, career stage. So perhaps after a first postdoc or because they get a, an opportunity to kickstart their independent career and, and get their hands on a project as a PI or a co-PI. Sometimes also the natural scientists arrive at very, very senior stage being a full professor with some kind of know-how that fits the need of the particular Chinese institution. Um, it's also probably not very surprising that uh, the foreign academics are concentrated in the sort of best funded and best ranked universities on the coast of China. So Beijing, Shanghai area, 
Zhejiang province and the south uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen Bay area. Um, now, also what we would like to uh, uh, bring to your attention is that there seems to, there is a small but uh, emerging group uh, of uh, foreign academics who got their PhD in China. So they've been educated in China and then they stay. Uh, so this is also something that would deserve further study. Next. Right, again, in this, yes, next, Xin. Ah, wonderful, great. Again, uh, this just this overview table, we just wanted to bring you again a quick comparison of how the different uh, literature has approached the definition and how that will, that affected the findings. Um, again, on the, on the, the, the uh, when we compare, for example, Esther Kim's paper from 2015, uh, which studied, um, instructors uh, at universities in Beijing, uh, the research finding told us that 41% of this population came from the from the US and 34% from Western Europe. Um, uh, this paper from 2015 arrived at the conclusion that moving to China to pursue an academic career there was a bit of a last resort uh, for people who didn't really get a better job elsewhere. That was 2015. Uh, when we compare it to Xin and Julio's project uh, that was carried out in uh, seven years, six or five, a couple of years later, we see uh, that uh, this may have changed. Um, and again, I would like to uh, bring to your attention the, the, the gender imbalance of the population under study, where it really seems that male academics uh, really significantly outnumber uh, the female, female ones. Uh, as you can see uh, um, in the two studies in, uh, that, uh, in the middle of this table uh, that are both working with the sort of type three, so meaning in more broad definition that includes uh, ethnic Chinese, uh, we would also see that the nationality and the, um, uh, of these people would include also people from uh, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, um, and so on. Next. Right. What are their motivations? So why did the people choose to come to China in the first place? Um, now, to some people in the West, this at the first glance may sound like a counterintuitive migration flow, right? We assume that people would be moving into the global West, not out of the global West. Uh, but as Xin has pointed out at the beginning of this presentation, China has really established itself as an attractive destination, not to everybody, especially perhaps not after three years of COVID, but it has established itself as uh, attractive destinations to some international academics. Why? We grouped the motivations into three broad categories. The first one is the professional opportunity. So if you get a good job offer where you can pursue a research interest, um, you may consider moving to China. China has really seen an expansion of the higher education and research sectors and job creation in this regard. So it's not surprising that some people will get a lucrative work package, both in terms of the salary and the research funding, more than would be the case in the West. Now, the second reason, which is entangled with the profession aspect is the cultural connection. Moving to China means moving to a dynamic, fast-paced environment, interesting cultural adventure, and an opportunity to experience all of this. Now, um, China itself as a country is especially important, especially for social scientists and humanities scholar as a kind of data production site. So, or data collection site, or rather like a site for, your, for the observation and field work. Now, this aspect has certainly suffered during COVID, but it is a very important aspect. Last uh, but not least is the personal link. So um, uh, many academics have moved to China because of some kind of personal link. Uh, again, in uh, Xin and Julia's project, project number three, 28% of the survey respondents had a Chinese partner. Um, but this extends beyond the sort of personal link of your spouse. Um, um, many people um, uh, moved to China also because they had some kind of existing social network there. A former student, uh, a colleague on a research project that invited them to China. Um, this uh, social link and a personal link um, is uh, an important aspect as well. And with this, let me pass on the microphone to Professor Huang. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, a majority of uh, uh, foreign academics working in Chinese universities uh, faced 
uh, some uh, challenges, for example, and we have identified two broad types of challenges they faced. First, it's about uh, professional uh, challenges. For example, we listed uh, some of the uh, professional uh, ch challenges they faced, for example, uh, power uh, relationship, including ambivalent, uh, ambivalent uh, reversed yet mistrusted. So, um, uh, these changes could be um, found in the three projects. And also uh, there's uh, some uh, challenges relating to professional isolation. And uh, some of them uh, claim that they were uh, considered to be outside. And uh, also uh, there are uh, challenges uh, concerning research funding uh, because in, in most Chinese universities they worked. Um, complain about uh, some important uh, documents and are not provided in English language, uh, but only in, in, in Chinese language. And other uh, Chinese include research freedom, administrative work, and teaching a duty. And the other type is uh, concerned with uh, non-professional challenges. They include, uh, as you may know, uh, cultural integration. As some of them uh, were not born or uh, educated in China. They uh, um, mentioned uh, they, they were faced uh, 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 a choice or uh, how to be uh, integrated in the local uh, culture or even to their uh, affiliations. And uh, um, other non professional Chinese uh, relating to um, legal procedures and living conditions. Next, please. And uh, in our uh, projects, we also uh, uh, research into um, one of the uh, important uh, topics uh, in relation to uh, international uh, academics working in Chinese university, that is, uh, uh, what are they expected to, uh, or uh, what are their expected roles? Uh, for example, in Project One, um, international academics reported that they were expected to uh, the following um, uh, work roles. Um, for example, they are expected to enhance the international reputation of their current universities. Um, second, they are expected to uh, yield high research productivity. This is especially true in the case of those who are high in uh, research intensive universities. Third, uh, they were expected to uh, play an active role in uh, carrying out other international activities, which cannot be uh, uh, assumed by the local academics. Fourth, uh, they are expected to bridge uh, their current uh, universities and universities of their home uh, uh, countries where they come from. And finally, uh, they are expected to organize faculty development activities, uh, recruiting more international students. And in uh, the other two projects, uh, Project 2 and Project 3, academics also see themselves as a, a bridge uh, builders who create links between uh, Chinese universities and their global academic networks. And their expected roles mirrored uh, new liberal uh, globalization of higher education in China and the world, which highlighted research productivity and international benchmarking. And further, uh, this could lead to uh, tokenism in recruiting internationals. Um, some of the uh, previous research. Uh, into uh, international faculty members working Japanese university um, uh, uh, confirmed almost a similar uh, research results. And uh, some of uh, their findings could be also uh, identified in our research into academics uh, who were uh, employed in Chinese universities. Next, please. And uh, uh, our projects are also um, <coughs> concerned with um, the research question, that is, are they uh, satisfied and will they stay? 
I think these two questions, uh, uh, two typical classic uh, questions relating to migration or internationalization of uh, 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 academics and, and scientists. And according to our uh, uh, findings, uh, they are generally satisfied with the working conditions. And this is uh, especially true in the case of those who uh, come from uh, STEM fields, uh, for example. And Project 3 uh, present uh, uh, this uh, uh, finding. And also, uh, uh, Project 3 uh, present, uh, presents the finding and uh, that is relating to uh, the fact that fast-paced environment funding and job security and light teaching and administration. But on the other hand, uh, dissatisfaction often grow with time. Uh, this is this result could be found in project two, and uh, this is especially true in the case of earlier career researchers and social scientists. And our uh, the second research question uh, that is, uh, will, will they stay? And we have also uh, some um, uh, new findings. And more research is, uh, is needed. Prelim uh, our preliminary evidence shows that foreign population has decreased in China's major cities like uh, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and the other uh, Guangzhou big cities. And for example, um, according to national uh, statistics from uh, uh, in Shanghai, uh, the number of uh, foreign population, uh, not all of them uh, belong to uh, uh, foreign uh, academics. It's just the total number of foreign population. The number decreased from uh, uh, 208,602 to uh, 163,954. And also uh, the number of uh, foreign population um, declined in Beijing. And one of the most important reasons for uh, such a decline numbers of uh, foreign population is uh, uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which uh, has led to uh, international travel uh, restrictions. And uh, the other uh, uh, source uh, also shows there was a, a de decline number of uh, population of European academics and who uh, worked in Chinese, uh, who worked in China. Next, please. And uh, uh, I'd like to, to conclude our. Uh, uh, presentation by, uh, by talking uh, international academics in, in Man China, uh, what do we need to know? There seem to be more uh, research questions to be uh, addressed and responded uh, in our uh, future uh, uh, research. Uh, we have listed some of the important uh, topics to be further uh, addressed. For example, what about those from outside the global West? For example, those uh, foreign academics coming from the Belt and the uh, Road countries. Uh, second, what about those who have left China? Uh, why did they leave? Uh, what, what, what's the reason for, 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 for their uh, uh, leaving from um, um, Chinese uh, or Chinese university. We know more about international academic entry than about their music. Well, why? Well, why? Why do they leave uh, their uh, uh, China's affiliations? And third, what about their engagement with knowledge circulation and epistemic justice? Fourth, how do they experience the changing lands? landscape of international academic mobility, for example, uh, due to the travel and the visa restrictions under the pandemic. And uh, uh, fifth, what are the long-term effects of the pandemic and the geopolitics on the population of international academics in uh, mainland China? Next, please. 
and uh, so uh, so much for our uh, joint present uh, presentation and uh, here we, we have uh, some uh, acknowledgments and also we uh, uh, have two page uh, reference thank you very much thank you for your attention great thank you very much futao thank you very much shin and andrea um, that was a really interesting coverage of, of the research and you highlight lots of interesting questions for discussion. Um, so I um, would really welcome any thoughts people have, um, reactions, um, comments either from personal experience or um, just, just points of information. I'm going to I'm going to start off because I because I think it, there's several things that I found very interesting in your in your research analysis. One was that you, you did seem to um, to rely on a distinction between or around ethnicity of your Chinese ethnicity, um, which uh, which I wondered whether what what that consequence of that was in terms of um, in terms of dividing up experiences, because um, you, the, the, none of the research seemed to particularly focus on on the ways in which different communities of researchers by ethnicity experience the time in China. And, I, and I'm reflecting here on some research I've done with um, African academics who have come to China to study. And, you know, that they've often experienced, um, particularly in the moments of COVID as well, some prejudice and, and, you know, certain experiences of racism outside the university and the communities in which they're living. So I wonder whether you wanted to talk a bit about the challenges of dividing up people around ethnicity. Um, I'd also be like to know more, a bit more about the um, the question you raised around tokenism, um, Putao, because because uh, I, I wondered whether um, why a university like in China would want to, to indulge in that. It, 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 I, surely there would be a way in which an international academic, if nothing else, would um, enable um, sort of uh, a publication profile that was probably aimed at anglophone publications and, and so on and so forth. So 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 what's the symbolic value here? But um, uh, I, I um well let me let me let me let me leave those with you and then um um see if you want to come back on any of those and then, then we'll go on to the questions. Thank you very much, David. I wonder if Andrea or if Vital, you would like to come first with um responding to any of the questions. Um, and Andrea, Andrea uh, you're muted. You mean you know, and I just read uh, what was uh, written in the chat room and some questions and relating to the last slides. And should, should I answer the first question and raised by David, that is uh, tokenism? Yeah, why don't you answer the tokenism question and then, then I'll come back to the questions in the chat and I'll invite people to come forward and ask those. So yeah, the uh, tokenism okay. one will be an interesting one, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, and we, we, have, we have done that three, uh, and uh, research based on three different projects and uh, sometimes we 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 got uh, different uh, research findings because uh, the target group uh, is different from each other and uh, my chapter project is mainly concerned with those uh, non-language teachers who uh, work in uh, research intensive universities, uh, local public universities, and two and uh, Sino uh, foreign uh, joint universities. And uh, so you can find that uh, the part of uh, uh, foreign language teachers uh, is not included in my research project. So and in terms of the tokenism, and I, I think uh, according to our research, uh, most of uh, research universities, including those local public universities, uh, uh, have tried to attract and hire uh, some uh, court uh, uh, star professors to increase the uh, uh, international global reputation. This is the first point. And then make, make full use of their international global uh, networks, second. And uh, third, uh, it is uh, to uh, how does that increase they are uh, benchmarking related in relation to international indicators, like uh, the percentage of international academics. And by uh, increasing in the, 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 such an international indicator, 
the international presence of the university could be uh, improved in some uh, major university ranking system. So in that sense, I, we used uh, the term uh, tokenism. Uh, this is very important. And some, in some cases, these star professors are used as the brand to attract uh, students and even, I mean, the academics. Okay, thank you very much, Fusha. That's that's very helpful. So it does sound a bit like a, a instrumentalism as much as tokenism, so possibly different from the Japanese case. But but that's that's really interesting. Thank you for that. I, I'm going to hand over. Um, I'm not going to. Well, I'm going to go straight to Phil. Phil, Phil Alback, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I had two questions, one a big one and one a little one, uh, but I think both important. The big one is the um, uh, points raised in uh, Futao's uh, last slide, of course, are most interesting ones. And I wonder if Futao or other members of the panel uh, could reflect on what the future may hold in terms of some of these uh, issues, particularly maybe the quote closing quote, unquote of, uh, of 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 China due to geopolitical you know uh, pressures and tensions and uh, you know with other countries maybe particularly the United States um, that would be interesting and the other little question but also important is uh, is there a guess from any of you on the percentage of uh, international academics who are of Chinese ethnicity, because um, I don't think that was mentioned in the presentations. And finally, thank you very much for a really, really interesting uh, present set of uh, presentations um, on an important topic, which I also think is hugely uh, relevant and important for other countries with significant uh, diasporas that are trying to make use of you know, those you know, uh, their compatriots who are working and living in other countries and trying to involve them uh, back home. I think immediately of Ethiopia and Pakistan, but there are many others as well. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Shin, can, can I respond, Philip, with two questions briefly? Yes. Thank you for, for your uh, questions, Philip. And, and first question is uh, about, uh, um, I mean, the uh, the future trend, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to foresee uh, in the future, but but you know, but some trends are, are clear. Uh, you may know that according to the speech uh, given by uh, President Xi in the party congress, the Chinese government has uh, issued a very clear strategy that is in the coming few years, China will make more efforts to attract uh, overseas Chinese, uh, especially those who were born educated in China, but uh, uh, had enjoyed a uh, global uh, reputation in, uh, in, in, in their uh, disciplines or fields, and including those professor scientists working in the advanced Western countries, especially, I mean, the uh, high, Highly profiled, profiled scientist in STEM fields. Um, this is very clear. That is, uh, more Chinese or overseas Chinese scientists with a global reputation uh, from hard sciences working in uh, leading universities in the United States, UK, Australia, Canada would be um, encouraged. Uh, or um, recruited and uh, will be attracted to come to work in Chinese university. Uh, I, I'm sure this is the general uh, uh, future trend. Uh, this is my answer to your first question. The second question is, uh, I mean, I mean the, the number of uh, uh, real uh, foreign academics and those overseas uh, Chinese that is, uh, and those who were born or educated in China um, before they uh, become um, Americans or Canadians or Australians or, or the British uh, scholars. Uh, we did uh, uh, 
field work in four uh, leading universities in Shanghai. And you may know these uh, uh, four universities, uh, uh, like Fudan, like Shanghai Jiao Tong and Tongji, and, uh, and, and the North, uh, East China Normal University. And we, we, we checked all the uh, uh, documents and we interviewed with some of them. And we found, according to our uh, case study, uh, of the four universities uh, based in Shanghai, uh, over 60% of so-called foreign academics or um, uh, born or educated in China before they um, went to the United States, UK, Canada, Australia, and uh, other uh, Western countries. So uh, this is safe to say that more than half of uh, foreign academics working in a leading university in Shanghai uh, uh, is not real or uh, in the narrow sense is not foreign academics. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Angela. I wonder if you would like to come in. Angela, I think you're on mute. Okay, now, <laughs> thanks a lot. Maybe I'm just going to chip in with a couple of uh, my thoughts and observations on the topic. I think that uh, Futao is absolutely right. Uh, I think that the long term trend uh, will be more uh, overseas Chinese and returning Chinese returning to China, um, both uh, because of the sort of push factors and certain factors that are pushing them out of the West, be it the precarious academic labor market, being the securitization of research and so on, um, but also pull factors, meaning simply that you know, leading Chinese universities have really good equipment and infrastructure to offer, simply good jobs to offer. And if there are good jobs, and if you also have family considerations, you have a family in China, of course you will consider. Now, uh, if we look at the more sort of the, the narrow definition, if we look at foreigners who, who do not have a Chinese background, there, um, it also remains open. However, it is absolutely clear that the last, uh, especially the last year, um, has really affected, uh, they're, they're really the dropout rate has been, has been very, very high. So in the slides, we include um, information that in terms of the Europeans in China, one third have left. Um, that was in 2021. Uh, in 2022, according to the latest data that I have, it's uh, more than a half that have left that sort of, quote unquote, have not survived the, the second uh, COVID summer. Um, so uh, at the same time, uh, also, it, it however, it would not be true to say that everybody, every foreigner is leaving China. No, some of people have decided to stay. Some people have also arrived. There are also people who have been attracted during COVID and who have been given the conditions and the entry uh, permission to enter during COVID. However, their numbers are very small. At the same time though, when it comes to the foreigners in China, there have always been a rather um, relatively high uh, turnover uh, high turnover, yeah. Um, so um, we will see. We will see where we will be from from five years from now. But I have to say that in terms of the the sort of Westerners, like classic quote unquote Westerners coming from the global West, um, I uh, would be surprised to see that the numbers would rebound fast. I don't see this um, happening very fast. Um, I would also like to go back to David's question in the beginning and really uh, highlight uh, the importance of this issue. Thanks, David, for bringing it up. Uh, how your ethnicity um, changes the lived experience that you have uh, working in, in China. This is also uh, one area where we would like to call for further research because you're absolutely right that when it comes to the, the white Westerners, yeah, uh, Shin uh, in her uh, paper with Julio have highlighted this kind of white privilege uh, that the people themselves are aware of very often, yeah, because it comes with certain privileges. It also comes with certain boundaries um, as other researchers working on the topic have also highlighted. Um, but uh, this lived experience would change dramatically if um, you are, as you say, African Africans in China. So we don't have enough research on this sort of South-South migration movements, and we should we should have more research on this. So I hope uh, that uh, more work will be done in this regard very soon. 
Thank you, Anja. Perhaps very quickly to follow up about the topic about the ethnicity, and thank you again for highlighting this issue, David. Uh, I think this also this is also relevant to the international student groups that are with increasing number in China at least before the pandemic, because the population of the international students have also been more diversified, and many of them are not from the global West. So, for instance, in our studies, there have been wide international academics who reflected upon how some of the institutions will be seeing them as representing all the internationals when dealing with issues, for instance, about African students, which the white colleagues are not really comfortable with and reflective of. So those issues are also entangled in international student mobility and international academic mobility. There's a great set of responses there. It just shows us that all our categories never quite hold down the complexity of lived experience. Yeah, absolutely. And um, certainly, I think it would seem to me that it's very uncertain what's, what's going to happen next. I, I'm aware that there is that, that some of the international students who haven't been able to go back have created a little uh, a student union called China International Student Union with a hashtag "Take Me Back to China." So, I mean, I think that there's you know very interesting questions around what's going to happen in the near future. Yes. So, I have a few more questions lined up. Um, um, Hui Anye asked me to ask his question for him because he says he can't get a speaker to work, and his question was really about the the the, the ways. It seems to me, um, I'll read it out to you. It would be interesting to learn more about how junior academics in humanities and social sciences compare with those in the natural sciences in facing um, a socio-political um, environment in China. He just sees, he mentions a, a conference where um, a joint venture initiative was, he says, shot down, was was um, not, not able to, to happen. So I, I don't know whether you've, you, you could comment on this, on, on experiences by field as well as by seniority. I mean, you, you have hinted at this in terms of the, the, the recruitment of seniors colleagues, but perhaps you could come to that. And then we'll go on to Ruth and Andrea. Um, I can start. Yeah, uh, so thanks. This is a very important question. So uh, again, when I draw on uh, our empirical research project, which looked into the experiences of the Europeans and in Chinese academia, there really was a stark difference uh, 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 in terms of the career stage and in terms of the social sciences, humanities versus natural sciences kind of experience. I mean, this is perhaps not surprising. Um, but uh, still, it deserves uh, it deserves we talk about this a little bit. Now, uh, it is especially in my present in, in this presentation a couple of minutes ago. I, I said in the slide that it's quite interesting to note that the social scientists very often arrive earlier to China, um, and um, and and that actually is exactly what puts them in an even more vulnerable position in the Chinese academia. Because if you are doing a PhD in China, either be it the whole PhD cycle or your your doing your PhD at a Chinese university, or perhaps you're doing a double degree, or perhaps you're doing a part of your PhD degree in China. But if even a postdoc, you, um, are, um, uh, you are seen, you have a different position that perhaps you would have had if you did the PhD in a Western university. For example, I'm doing my PhD in Finland. I'm constantly reminded of the fact that I am a researcher, I'm not a student, I am a doctoral researcher. Now that might be different in China because doctoral researchers in China are, for most part viewed as students. Um, and that impacts on the kind of position, the social position that you might have in the department, in the faculty and in the university. Um, and uh, um, that also ties to the question of, of salaries uh, and scholarships, which are, are low or very low um, in China, even for the postdoc level, which is why, for example, postdoc, uh, postdocs may be asked to draw on external funding which, however, is easier to get for a foreigner, uh, for a foreign academic, if you are in natural sciences, because uh, um, for um, for international academics and social scientists, um, they may have um, a more difficult position, sort of uh, recognizing the kind of language or the kind of framing that um, might be welcome in a Chinese institution. Um, one of the research participants that um, I would like to sort of paraphrase here. Uh, um draw this parallel with a uh, switching between tv programs so if you are sort of uh, working in, in western academia you're publishing in, in english journals and in international journals you are uh, somehow speaking a different language than if you switch tv channel 
into a Chinese academia and you're asked to publish in Chinese and speak uh, in, in Chinese. Doesn't mean that the research isn't happening. It means that different research questions are asked, different frameworks are being used. Um, and that might be for somebody who um, comes from a different place, not China, was not, did not grow up in China, that might be extremely difficult to walk through. So yeah, I think that also might add to the challenges um, that junior academics may face Yeah, when they're doing, especially social science research in China. Great, thank you, Andrea. I mean, there's more to say here, but I, I really want to make time yeah. for the last couple of questions. Is it okay if I go on to Ruth, please? Were you asking for me to say something? Uh, if, you'd, if you'd like to ask your question, please, Ruth, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, sure. I didn't hear clearly, sorry. Yeah, I, what interests me very much is what kind of picture and impression these individuals give when they're at conferences in the Western world where there is very you know, strong stereotypes about the lack of academic freedom, about the closure, about all the issues. I lived in China for many years, not so recently, but it seems to me individuals who have lived and worked and done research and interacted with students and colleagues are able to give so much more nuanced and accurate a picture of what academic life is like in China. And it seems to me it would be really great if your research study, you could do a little bit of follow up with people after they have left to find out how they're interacting and how they're communicating their experience of teaching and research in China. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And it's great to have you given all the work you've done over yeah, the years. Thanks. Um, Shin or Andrea, do you want to respond to that? Um, perhaps can I make a start and then I'll pass on to Andrea and Tao. So thank you Ruth again for this really important uh, insight and, and topic, which I personally think will be really important and valuable to follow up with in future studies, not necessarily done by ourselves, but we invite our colleagues working in this field to investigate this. And in terms of how the um, lived experience in China have influenced academics uh, perceptions of the Chinese academia and Chinese society. Actually, for those who have been working in China that we've interviewed, uh, many of them, as you said, were able to give a more nuanced discussion and explanation of some of the issues. And, and, and although some of them may, may say that, or they can be considered as an outsider by some people, they actually got much of the insider knowledge of the system through the lived experience. So that's something that perhaps potentially will be with the, that they will bring with them even after they leave China. But this again, de deserves further empirical study. Mm. Yeah, right. and perhaps uh, just to a quick note, just to add on that. Uh, thank you, uh, absolutely. This is a very important comment and I would just like to state again that um, it's very important to know that China really is not a monolith and it's absolutely also not static. It evolves and it evolves very, very fast. And I'm also responding partially to some of these comments that appeared in the chat box. I mean, thank you for bringing this up. This is very important to note that there are different cities in China, even within the cities, the institutions are very, very different and they can, they can offer very different uh, working conditions. So yeah, this is, um, is it a joint venture institution? Is it the public uh, research university? Is it, you know, a double world-class university, listed university, is it not? Um, so um, you're absolutely right that this is something that uh, we need to bear in mind and we invite further research on the topic. Great, thank you, Andrea. I'm gonna uh, ask Andrea Lane to, to ask the last question very quickly and a very quick response, Andrea. Uh, okay, very quick. Um, so, hi there. Um, so it's an interesting talk. Thanks so much. It's great to have the discussion. Um, so a couple of things. I think one interesting thing to research is also how the language ability of the expat is actually influencing the experience. Because if I speak, so I used to be an academic in China. If I speak Chinese, I have a very different experience and inclusion in the system than if I'm just an English speaker, right? So it's a power aspect to that. Um, I, and I think that would be really interesting. Maybe you have some findings. And the second comment I just have is, 
I think there's a difference whether you're on a branch campus um, and teach there, um, both in terms of what is your background and why you're there, why you were recruited versus a Chinese university. So maybe have you got any findings from there um, or any further interest in research in that? Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Andrea. A lived experience for us to end with. Shin, Andrea, you have 30 seconds. Oh, thank you so much for this question. And language issue, really important. But actually, in our research, we found that academics, international academics, they found them in a golden bubble, that there are some privileges, but also the, they're in a bubble with a foreigners. And the foreigners does not stop even if you speak Chinese language. So that's something that maybe we can reflect a bit further in the future research. But again, if you if people if the uh, international academics speak Chinese, that will make a difference. But to what extent that it will break the foreignness bubble, it's uh, is a question for further exploration. I wonder if Anja and Futao may want to come in at this point. Yeah, just at one point, that's the best of our comparative study between those coming from and hard sciences and the soft sciences. We found the right, for those coming from soft sciences, that is humanities, social science, uh, they are always um, so in. The, it is a little more library ability required of them, that is uh, from the humanities and social sciences. This is the number of our findings. Yeah. This is the first point. But if yeah. you are, uh, 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 like my answer to, 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 to Philip a uh, few minutes ago, and since uh, more than half of uh, foreign academics are, uh, are not real and foreign academics, that is, uh, more than half of them uh, were born, were born or uh, educated in, in China. I mean, before they, they, they went to the United States or the UK, and they, they, there's no any any memory problem for them, so uh, they can be uh, easily engaged in uh, some administrative, I mean, the uh, activities. So uh, this presents an, 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 an sharp contrast to those. Uh, um, how to say this? Uh, who were born in 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 in, in United States, uh, UK, or other English speaking countries? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps add to this. I actually wouldn't uh, over. I would put too much emphasis on the on the language issue. I mean, obviously that is an issue, but that's not the China specific issue. I mean, Chinese is the official administrative language of People's Republic of China. German is the official administrative language of Germany. I think that you know this is not a China specific issue. And um, uh, uh, at the same time, especially if you are a natural scientist, you are simply you have not been hired in order to speak Chinese. It's not presupposed that you are speaking Chinese, but you have to accept the fact that if you don't speak Chinese, it will exclude you from certain things. You may not be able to participate in the faculty life. You may not be able to participate in, in committees and so on. And also you may have issues with applying for certain grants, for example, because these grants, these applications are written and submitted in Chinese. Um, so you're, you're right. I mean, it absolutely is a double-edged uh, sword. Um, and um, yeah. Um, you're right, the type of uh, institution also matters. Some research has been done specifically in the environment of the, the branch campuses. Um, our empirical research project, for example, excluded the branch campuses and only looked at people who are working for Chinese public universities, um, where the sort of concentration of foreign staff is lower because the branch campuses have very high a number of their staff. It's the whole point that, the, that, their, that their workforce are, are internationals. Um, that is, of course, different in the Chinese public universities. So yeah, uh, thanks for bringing this aspect, yeah. Great, thank you all. I'm sorry we're gonna to have to bring this to yeah. an end. Um, you've highlighted the importance, I think, with Ruth's comments, brilliantly so, of, of, of this um, rich quality of research into the diverse variety of lived experiences. You've highlighted how much how important Chinese Academy is to the global science system. We, we know that already in terms of the, 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 the placing of the top Chinese universities. And so you've left us with a whole set of research questions. And as of course, the perfect end to a seminar is more research is needed. Um, you've done a, a great job of highlighting what, what work has been done, 
and um, and the need to really understand more the politics of language and of, of collaboration of ethnicity as well. So thank you all very much, um, Shin, Futao, Andrea. Great emphasis webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, come back on Tuesday, everyone. Um, our next webinar is taking us back to Europe and the Uni Europe University alliances, which, which I think are a very interesting form of pan-European collaboration. Um, finally, one more thanks to you all. A great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.